Thanks for everybody uh, joining us. My name is Greg Zuckerman. I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I'm thrilled to be here to moderate this panel. Uh, we've got a real mix of, uh, of all kinds of interesting experts from the entire industry. And we're going to talk about things, uh, not just the XL pipeline. So uh, <laughs> that'll, that'll keep everybody glued to their seat. I'm going to quickly just go through, name who's on the panel. Um, you can look in the booklets and elsewhere to get more details about everybody. Uh, I think this is alphabetical. So David uh, Collier, President, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Uh, uh, where is David? Here we go. Thank you, David. Um, Tom Fanning to my right, uh, Chairman, President, CEO of Southern Company. Um, we all know um, the Senator to my left, uh, Senator Mary uh, Landrieu. And then we've got um, um, uh, Joe Naylor, Vice President of Strategic Planning of Chevron Corporation. And last but not least, probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but we all, uh, I'll do it nonetheless. Uh, T-Bone Pickens, entrepreneur, philanthropist, founder, BP Capital. Did I miss anything? It's probably some other oh, you got it all. Descript description of you. That's great. So we're going to jump right in. We have a lot to cover and a lot of uh, interesting personalities on the panel who I'm sure have different viewpoints. So the first question I'm going to have, uh, and I'll, I guess we'll start off uh, with Mr. Pickens on this one, is... We're in the middle of a remarkable energy resurgence in this country, one that's really shocked everyone, the experts and others. Um, there are skeptics out there who wonder how long it's going to last and what the implications will be. Give me your sense for whether people are overdoing it, going overboard on this natural gas and oil resurgence. People talk about energy independence. Give me your sense for kind of is this overblown or it's as important as uh, people make it out to be? Well, I've been in the business forever. All of you know that. Uh, I got out of school in 51 as a geologist, <clears throat> and I've worked as a geologist my whole 60 or 70 years in the industry. And this is a different uh, uh, resource that we're dealing with now. In the past, that the oil fields kept getting smaller and smaller because we found the big ones first. And now we are in a situation where we have the shale basins and the resources are almost unlimited. And what the way it's unfolding, you've got easily, an, I think, 4,000 trillion cubic feet of gas to recover. I just bumped into a guy coming in here. He says, that 4,000 trillion good? I said, if I was going to do anything with it, I'd move it up, not down. Hmm. Uh, there is so much gas, and what's going to happen is the recovery techniques are going to get better and better. When the Barnett Shale was discovered uh, 10 years ago in North Texas, it wasn't discovered, but we found out we could drill horizontal wells and do multiple fracks in the horizontal hole, and that it looked like 5% uh, recovery would be what you were looking at. <clears throat> that recovery has now gone to 30 to 40%. It'll even go up from there. And what happens is if you're not recovering uh, if you're not draining, you will, you will downspace the wells to drill. So <clears throat> like the Marcellus, it's, it's going to be the largest gas field in the world. And it is just scratched is all. Now, does the production decline? Of course it does. First oil or gas you take out of a reservoir, you are starting to now deplete the reservoir. But here, the decline has, we watch the decline curves here, they are steep at first and then they flatten out and the decline is very uh, minimal as you go out into the future. So you're going to, the, the Marcellus, uh, that reservoir will be produced for over 100 years. Oh. So it's, it's an opportunity this country has and then you throw in the wind, the solar uh, and all and we have resources abundant. We just don't have an administration that will recognize what this country has. But get off the OPEC oil and get on our own resources. It's that simple. Okay, um, Joe, want to uh, give us your own thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, certainly within the United States over the last 10 years, we've seen a, an incredible increase in the amount of resource that we think is going to be recoverable. If we just extend that, and we've talked about gas, but also oil, I think that we, the uh, Horizontal drilling and the hydraulic fracturing really started with with gas, but I think on the uh, we're seeing that now with oil. Every year, the forecasts for the recoverable resource from oil in the United States just keep going up and up and up to the point now where the U.S. oil production could be 11, 12 million barrels a day. Mm. 
we could be larger yeah, than anyone at, else. We're about eight right now. Yeah, right? yeah. but that's larger so, than it's ever been. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We, so it's we a, it's peaked a, in seventy at ten million. And so this is a phenomenal opportunity yeah. here. And so just a couple numbers as to what what the oil and gas sector contributes to the U.S. economy. It's over a trillion dollars a year. It's at eight percent of our GDP. So we have a unique generational opportunity here. And I think it's up to us to really make sure we're taking full advantage of it. Um, David, want to weigh in? Yeah, I guess the, the uh, perspective I'd add to that is uh, shale gas is a great technology success story. And I think when we look at the oil and gas business, people often characterize as mature business, old technology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think we're actually at the very early stages of you look at shale gas, tight oil, uh, oil sands in Canada. Uh, these are relatively immature resources, and I think a long way to go on the technology side yet. That's going to drive costs down. It's going to uh, further enhance the resource base. It's going to help us deal with environmental challenges. So I think we're at uh, just the perspective I'd add is uh, early, early stages, in my view, of how technology can impact this business. Can I, can I build on that? Just, yeah. So just one other data point here. So we talk a lot about tight oil and tight gas production, but the other big area and the other big resource that's going to be coming out there is from deep water. Yeah. Right? In, the, in the 60s, 70s, deep water was 600 feet of water. Mm -hmm. Today it's 12,000 feet, and then we're drilling another 20,000 feet below that. So just to David's point, and this is a high-tech business, and we're constantly applying, developing and applying new technologies to get resources to market. Here's a question that I'll direct uh, first at um, both, I guess, um, um, Tom and, and Joe, representatives of big, huge companies. Why did the experts get it so wrong when it came to this revolution? In other words, all the academics, all the majors, the Wall Street investors, they're all betting that natural gas and oil production would drop in this country, and yet there's been this big resurgence. Why did they get it wrong, and what can we learn for the future? I think we always undershoot uh, technology innovation. One time in my career, I was CIO, and I always like to make the joke that CIO stands for career is over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I can assure you that even as we think now about the recoverability of gas and even the attractiveness of the United States coal supplies and the whole portfolio of energy that we're blessed to have, it's imperative on us to continue to have kind of this uh, missionary zeal to think about innovation as we have thought about it in IT. Let's think about it in energy and think about how much value we can create. I think if we get, I, I co-chair at the Business Roundtable, the North American Energy Security idea. And if we get that right, my view is it is so profoundly important, not only to everybody in this room, but your parents. We have the opportunity of a lifetime. Energy security breeds national security, breeds economic security. We can add 2 to 4% to GDP. We can add 3 million jobs. We can reduce the national deficit by a trillion six all by 2025. By doing what? By, by developing natural gas, reducing uh, limitations on exporting, uh, increasing oil production, finding uses for 21st century coal, taking advantage of all of our natural resources. In fact, another discussion I think we'll get to, but the full portfolio, nuclear, 21st century coal, natural gas, renewables, energy efficiency, anything America can do to improve our standing. I think we can be a net exporter, energy secure by 2020, the biggest energy producer on the globe by 2030, 2035. So the majors underestimate technology, you're saying? We all do. Uh, environmentalists underestimate it. Uh, companies underestimate it that, that are energy consumers. We used to be a big coal company. Now we're the second or third largest natural gas consumer in the United States. I love natural gas. But, fellas, it is not a panacea. We need them all. Yeah. Can I add something to sure. that, please? This is a very important question because I've thought about it a lot. It's hard to figure why we continue to underestimate it. We don't underestimate breakthroughs in health. Hmm. In fact, we're quite aspirational about that. We, for space, very aspirational about it. But there's something about energy, the subject of it, which is contrary to my philosophy, being the senator from Louisiana and now chair of the Energy Committee. I haven't been in the business as long as T. Boone Pickens, <laughs> who I admire a great deal, but I've been an Very elected people, official. <laughs> <laughs> but I have been an elected official since I'm 23 years old, representing a great energy producing state. And I cannot even answer that question as well, to why that is. Mm. Because 
At home, where we know a lot about this, we even underestimated it, most people, but the breakthroughs came from people in Texas, in Louisiana, just believing and believing that they could find a better way. So I think the whole country did, you know, did us a great disservice by underestimating, but we've got this new technology now, and I agree and, and a thousand percent Senator, with what we need to do. Can I respond Let, to that? Yeah. Go ahead. I can tell you where a big part of the problem is, is this country does not have an energy plan. Well, yeah. We have no energy plan. And, uh, you know, that, uh, what is unique about America <clears throat> is that we have freehold minerals. Mm -hmm. Okay, freehold minerals is when you buy the surface, you get everything below the surface. We're the only country in the world that has that. You buy a farm in Poland uh, and you get the surface the below the surface belongs to the state. In the United States, we're the only country. There have been over five million wells drilled in the world today, and over half of them have been drilled in the United States. Mm -hmm. That is because we have freehold minerals. That's why we've, even with restrictions that we've had for the industry, we're still the biggest uh, producer of oil and gas in the world. Hey, let me offer up another yeah. potential reason why. Somehow the idea of energy consumption has gotten a bad name. We should use less. Look, we're all environmental conservationists. We are. We all you know, want to husband our natural resources effectively. We should use less where we can, but we should use more where we should. 48% of the families we are privileged to serve in the Southeast, about four and a half million customers, make less than 48,000 bucks a year. And all those folks want is for their kids a better place to live, better food on the table, better medical care, better education. The way they're gonna do that is to improve the wealth creation. Energy production is fundamental to their standard of living and we need to advance those causes. It's all about creating an unassailable advantage for America, for jobs, personal income growth, and just a better life. And Greg, if I can just add one other perspective on that. I, I think a lot of this has to do, we, we are, as an industry, extremely focused on technology. We always have been, frankly. But I don't think we've actually had to talk about it. We just went quietly about our business for a long time, uh, did pretty well at it, uh, had broad public support for what we did. Uh, we live in a different environment now where I think we as an industry have to be a lot more visible and vocal about what we do, how we do it, and what we can achieve going forward. So I think the, the uh, external environment in which we're operating, to your point, Senator, has changed dramatically. And I think that it's now incumbent on us as an industry to talk differently and express ourselves differently in terms of what we can achieve going forward. And I don't think we've had to do that in the past. In, in my view, don't talk about, we can't talk about ourselves. No, through it's the eyes be about of the customer. Absolutely, through the eyes of the customer. Let's talk about policy, government policy. I've heard some criticism already of, uh, of U.S. government policy. Um, some on the left kind of say that the Obama administration has been activist enough. Um, the Keystone pipeline hasn't been decided. It's sort of kicking it down the road. Um, and there needs to be more kind of attention to this addiction to fossil fuels and methane leakage, things like that. And those on the right, maybe some on, the, on this panel as well, kind of think that the government is getting in the way, um, even though we've, we've had a tremendous resurgence. Uh, you talk to guys like Harold Hamm and others, they complain all the time about the government. Give me your sense for right now what the policy is, or there isn't any policy perhaps, uh, some would argue, um, and whether it has helped or hurt this resurgence, A, and B, where's it going? Um, will the administration make a decision on Keystone, and what will it be, and, and other kind of uh, steps? Um, Senator? Well, I'll start by saying the obvious, I think, to this audience, and particularly with T. Boone, this particular administration has not embraced all of the possibilities out there um, for developing America's energy resources, and there are political reasons for that. But I think that that is hopefully starting to change. Uh, I can tell you, as a Democrat in the United States Senate, there are at least 15, 16, 20 Democrats in our side that are really starting to understand, because it's not just now Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, Oklahoma, et cetera. It's Pennsylvania. It's New York. Because constituents own the mineral rights, and constituents are going to their senators and congressmen and saying, listen, we've discovered oil or gas on my property. This is going to help me you know, buy my third or fourth pickup truck, or this is going to help me send my kids to, to college, or this is going to help me build my business. What do you mean I can't drill here? What do you mean we can't get the resources out? 
Number two, I think there's a growing pride and understanding between Canada and Mexico. The political changes in Mexico are very encouraging. I mean, we're not there yet, but just the early signs. And then Canada, just like America's, our, one of our uh, wonderful allies, their commitment to protecting the environment is really second to none. And so the opportunity to create a broad, like Tom said, North American energy powerhouse with two democracies, particularly Canada, which is such a, a mature ally of ours, I mean, it's just there for the taking. And we've got to streamline our permitting processes in Washington. We have the Commerce Department, the State Department, the Energy Department, kind of all the EP, you know, EPW um, on top of each other, and get a real clear policy about producing American energy for American jobs and build the three million jobs we need to put this recession way in the in the rearview mirror and get you know get our economy moving. Now it's going to take you know more political kind of coming to the center, which is what I'm proud to help try to build in Washington. We need a centrist policy, and hopefully we can pull both sides to the center and get it done. Okay. See, Senator, I think you got it exactly right. In fact, I think with your leadership, Senator Murkowski on the Republican side, in the Senate anyway, we can get bipartisan support around a, a, a sensible energy policy. In fact, in my opinion, Congress is the only entity with the right lens. As a CEO of a company, I'm clean, safe, reliable, affordable. That's what I've got to deliver to my customers. Congress has that lens also. And so we've got to make sure that we set policies through Congress, not regulators. Number one. Number two, the other thing we got to do is weave together the benefits of energy policy with economic policy. Because at the end of the day, Maslow's hierarchy, whatever, people want a job. They want a good standard of living. And that's what energy can do, is the most fundamental thing everybody in America uh, is a customer of. Let me build on just a, a couple points. I'll, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, having access, you know, as an oil company, having access to land where we can develop um, resources, that's, that's key. Uh, and, and the you other right is, now, and you don't feel you do? In, in many areas, well, the, on the west, either- On the it's heavily owned by the federal government. The federal government or offshore? Some public drilling yeah. you want. Okay, so that, that, that'd be one. Another, and I think just to your point, a, a very, uh, streamlined permitting process. We're not trying to cut corners, but we want to make sure that the permitting process can move forward expeditiously. And third is a, is a fiscal regime, a tax policy that encourages investment. And you know, we're not seeing that now. I guess the other aspect, and we Hold have- Hold on a second, both, why do you say what, we're not seeing that now? Let me, let me just finish the final point here. Uh, there's also a, a lot of debate around the crude exports and LNG exports on the United States. And we have a phenomenal opportunity, back to Tom's point about jobs, you know, by truly having a free market in a global sense, we are going to really be able to reap the full rewards of this uh, energy renaissance that we're seeing in the United States. Don't you have a slide yeah. of that? Uh, we could, I'm not sure. I don't know if you, they do, but yeah. anyway, there's a great slide in this packet about the potential for exports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and all the jobs isn't tied up just in the energy production. Remember, oh, it's, it's this unassailable advantage of manufacturing. We're seeing we 95, that 95 billion dollars worth of new investments yeah. in manufacturing chemical facilities in the Gulf Coast over the course of the next four or five years. That's really catalyzed by this affordable gas that we're able to produce with and, this uh, advent technology. if you technology. export it, the price will go up. I mean, T can speak, you know, T Boone more about the details of this, but the price will go up slightly. But we will natural still gas have we're about, or natural or? gas, exports of natural gas. The price will go up slightly, but we'll still have such an advantage over any other place in the country for our manufacturing here. And as a senator from, from my state, I tell people, they say, all you want to do is produce and export because you all will make money. No, Louisiana is a huge consumer of natural gas, as Tim who knows. We use natural gas to create fertilizers, all sorts of petrochemical products. So we want to produce it and consume it. So it's exactly what Tom said. You want to have, yeah, this is our potential for exports, U.S. energy surplus. We've been having whatever little energy or whatever feeble energy policy we have has all been organized around declining resources, scarcity, growing demands and scarcity. America has to wake up and realize the game is changed. 
We need to be now managing abundance, yes. managing our surplus, exactly. and taking advantage of that in a way that taps into you know natural gas, which is the natural cleaner bridge to a cleaner future. But it's not, you know, and it's the most obvious, most reachable bridge right now. But if we continue our good technologies on wind and solar and wave and some other interesting uh, technologies out there, who knows what the future might bring. And then let me just offer this up again. Depending on what day you measure it or whatever, Southern Company is the second or third largest natural gas consumer in the United States. Mm. We used to be a big coal company. Now we do natural gas. Um, you need the whole portfolio, number one. Number two, I 100% full exports of natural gas. And that sounds weird because, yeah, okay, nominal prices go up, volatility goes up. Generally speaking, that's bad for business. But I think the overall benefit to the economy is so compelling mm. that we win by the value of the strengthened economy more than we are damaged by higher or more volatile gas prices. Um, we didn't Very answer convenient. Keystone. I'm sorry. Let's go around and just kind of get a sense for whether you think Keystone will be approved at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I'm just going to come back to the regulatory okay, process. Then I'll come, I will come in at sure. Keystone. But just on the regulatory process, Canada has put in place legislated timelines for regulatory reviews. Yeah. And that's not to prejudge the outcome of the regulatory review process, but it basically says from a competitive standpoint, you need to get through the process within a certain period of time. That's what we need. Um, Very good. Or we're six years in now on Keystone. <laughs> um, I think it's six years. Uh, you know, under the Canadian legislative environment, that could not happen. Hmm. You'd have to get to a decision. Uh, and, and Keystone, I think, is just a travesty in terms of the length of time it's taken and the, the various perturbations in the review process. Um, if you look at it on any, in our view, look at it on any objective basis around the national interest determination, environmental performance, uh, security of supply, uh, economic impact, it passes on all counts. And I think the, the uh, State Department's review twice has uh, come to that same conclusion, and uh, we just need to move on. I think it's a, it's a missed opportunity if we don't uh, make this happen, and I think in the context of the point the Senator was making, the opportunity for North America, jobs, environmental performance, the energy security, and all the benefits that come with that, yep. uh, we need to get on with it. Do you want to give a shot at Keystone? Sure. Hey, let me just further endorse the Canadian one-stop shop, the Canadian clearinghouse, whatever you want to call it, is the right way to go. It is the best practice on the continent, so well done there. Uh, it absolutely should be built, no question about it. Look at a map of the United States with all the pipes on it. To the, to the extent we think there's this game changer in terms of finishing out the pipe that should be built, I think is, is, is ludicrous. We need to finish the pipe, build it, and move on. Same. It should have been built years ago. Yep. I think it will be built. I think the approval will come. Very disappointed that the White House has pushed it back yet again. Um, but it is 1,000 miles of pipeline. We already have 2.9 million already built in the country. <laughs> Most of it is yeah. under, you see that, Louisiana? <laughs> you see Louisiana and wow. Texas, we know a lot about pipelines. <laughs> and if you put the OCS up there, which is the Outer Continental Shelf, 200 miles that rings this country, the only pipelines that you would see connecting to the huge wealth of gas and oil that we have off the coast of Louisiana and Texas would be pipelines connecting basically our refineries, sending energy, you know, inex not inexpensive, but reasonably priced energy clean to other parts of the country. But we are having, uh, we're going to have, a, a, I think, in the next couple of weeks, some major discussions, at least in the Senate, on this issue. And I'm proud to help lead that effort mm -hmm. to get it built. You know, everything we've said <laughs> here at this panel, I agree with kind of peculiar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I agree with the whole thing. I come down to, all right, where is the missing link in what we're talking about? It's going to help our economy. We're going to use our own resources. You know, down the line you go, there's 10 things that have come out of the comments up to now that are good. Where is the missing link? The leadership is where it is. We're all sitting here talking and we're asking for leadership and it is in Washington. And I don't feel, and I, I don't want to in any way hurt your feelings and because you and I have been on the same side of this issue for years. And, but uh, you say, well, of course they are. She's from Louisiana and he's from Texas. Nah. They have to be on the same side of the issue. <laughs> no, we don't. That is not true. I mean, that you're on the right side of the issue for the right reasons. It's good for this country. It's what it is. 
and the economy can be real, your missing link is Washington leadership. You just don't have it. And I don't know whether we get it or not, but you went, I talk about my guys a little bit, but uh, you go back through uh, the Bush administration, uh, eight years there, we didn't get anything out of there. <laughs> we go to the Obama administration and Bush never did talk the, the industry down, Obama does, but not much happened. And here we are 14 years, Bush, Obama, and there hadn't been any leadership show up anywhere in the whole thing that we're, we're talking about here. And it's just, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it, it, I'm getting to the point at my age, I wonder why. may have to run. <laughs> <laughs> that I wonder whether I ever see the leadership in Washington. Right now, the leadership should be focused on demand in this country. We got plenty of supply, but, but raise demand, that comes jobs, profits, taxes, the whole thing works. It's too simple, and I was told in Washington, and I'll conclude in about 15 seconds, but I was told in Washington a month or two ago, said, you know, Boone, you had a really good plan, but it was too simple. <laughs> I've concluded. <laughs> I'd like to be contentious, but I cannot be. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, essentially we, we believe free markets work and, you know, having Keystone or any, yeah, whether that's exporting crude or bringing crude in from Canada, I think uh, very supportive. All right. T. Bill Pickens wants to hear a question that he doesn't want, that he doesn't like, that he's going to be a little contentious. So I'll, I'll ask all of you guys, are you guys at all worried that years from now, your grandchildren are going to look back and say, Weren't you guys, weren't you people, part of the reason why the United States continue its addiction to fossil fuels? And if you believe in global warming and you believe fossil fuels contribute to fossil fuel, uh, to global warming, weren't you guys part of the problem? I'll take that. Uh, Southern Company is the only company in America today building out the full portfolio. Everybody says all the above. We're building a new nuclear plant, the first one in a generation of Americans. We're building a coal plant that is cleaner from a carbon footprint that will be, we believe, when we finish it, cleaner than a natural gas plant. We're building natural gas. We're doing uh, renewables. We're doing energy efficiency. You need the full portfolio. There will be changes over time as we inexorably will innovate around energy. But you got to build all the options out. With the more uncertainty, every option has value. So, therefore, let's invest in all the options. We're doing it. We're providing solutions, not rhetoric. And I would just say, you know, if you were maybe starting with a completely clean slate and you asked that question, then, you know, we had lots of options. We might want to start with something other than fossil fuel. But the problem or the challenge or the great benefit is we are blessed all over the country with oil and gas in the world and the entire infrastructure of the planet is completely invested already. And you can't just flip a switch and step on in a different direction. So we've got to gradually, smartly, gradually, deliberately move to the natural gas, which is the natural bridge to a cleaner future, take the profits that we're all going to make in the world and continue to invest in reducing the carbon footprint. It's not walking away from our responsibilities to reduce the carbon footprint, but it's also not being so foolish as to say, well, if we go one more centimeter up with carbon, the world is going to end, and so everybody's got to stop what we've been doing for 200 years and immediately change. Nothing works like yeah. that. Even if you had uh, dictatorships, which we don't, we're a democracy, you couldn't get that done. You can't get it done in a democracy. So go with the democratic flow of things, which is making smart, gradual changes that are meaningful and allow our utilities, like some of the great companies here that are doing that change, to help lead the way. And, you know, I think we can get there. I don't feel as, and I'm a parent. I have two children. I just had my first grandchildren. I have 37 nieces and nephews. My parents and my family have been in public service collectively for over, you know, with my husband's family, 100 years. I mean, we've invested a lot of time 
in building a great country. The last thing I want to do is leave it worse to our kids and grandkids. So every day I'm trying to build it better. But you have limits as to, so these people that say, oh, we're going to put everything on wind. We could no more do that <laughs> right. than the man in the right. moon. You know, we've got to move gradually to, like I said, and we can do it and lead the world. And I'll tell you what I'm impressed with about Canada. I didn't know that much about the, can can, you know, the Canadian piece of this until about two years ago. They are the most patient <laughs> people. They really have their Becoming eyes. Becoming a little less so. <laughs> no, they're getting less, but they are so patient. But we're still patient. They're patient, and they are very, very environmentally conscious. I mean, they have an environmental regime that I think is stronger than ours. They are very, very conscientious about it. And so for us to push them back, we should be embracing Canada as a partner and then taking our combined knowledge down to Mexico and helping Mexico get their economy moving forward, creating jobs down there, and hope and opportunity for people who are desperate. And we can do that. Greg, let me, uh, let me riff a little bit on your, on your comment here. So um, you know, is there an alternative to, uh, to the fuels that we're using today? Let me talk globally just for a moment. So uh, the International Energy Agency forecasts a number of things. One of the things they forecast is the demand for energy around the world. Over the course of the next 20 years, energy demand is going to increase 40%. Why is that? Well, population is growing dramatically, right? We're going to have 9 billion people in 2035. But what's more interesting is those 9 billion, a greater and greater proportion of them are going to be in the middle class. We're 2.3 billion in the middle class today, over 5 billion in the middle class. Think about that. As we enter the middle class, what do we want? We want a fridge, we want air conditioning, we want a car. That takes energy. And today, there is really no alternative to fossil fuels to deliver the type of energy that you and I consume every day. So today, about 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. In 2035, what do you think it is? Same thing. 80%. It doesn't change. Yes, renewables increase, but it goes from about 1% to 3%. So I think we, you know, there's a little bit of a a reality check here of is there truly an alternative to delivering the kind of energy that all of us consume every day? And I, I'm sort of thinking about the global population. There's a trade-off between the economic development, helping people, lifting people out of poverty, providing them the type of energy that we consume, balancing that with some of the environmental concerns there. So I think we really need to keep in mind both, both sides of this balance. So, well, one thing that is you focus on is 70 percent of all the oil produced every day in the world, which is 92, be, 92 million barrels, is produced every day. 70 percent of it goes for transportation yeah. fuel. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it. You, my God. And somebody says, you need to get off of fossil fuels. Yeah. Show me how you're going to wow. do that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it is impossible. You can't. I was on a panel, I don't know, it was 10 years ago, and the guy said, shut down all fossil fuels in the morning, stop it right now. And I said, okay, shut them down. What are you going to use? He said, hell, I don't care. <laughs> I said, you don't care, but give me an answer. What is it? He said, no, we'll be forced to do the right thing then. I said, man, you're going to, everything going to come to a halt real fast if you're going to shut it down Monday morning and try to figure out something by the end of the week. <laughs> well, I mean, but you get these people that are silly. I mean, you aren't going to shut off fossil fuels. It, it's, you can't do it. But Boone, you would be in favor of more natural gas for, as a transportation fuel and more electric cars as a transportation fuel. Sure. And, and, yeah. and, uh, and know this when you talk about, I, see, I'm after 8 million heavy-duty trucks. 8 million out of what? Eight million out of 250 million vehicles in America, so I'm after three percent of the vehicles. And I say, hey, just give me three percent, and I'll show you what I can do. Well, you three percent is three million barrels of oil a day. You can cut out 75 percent of OPEC with eight million trucks. It's that simple. But they say, well, we want the battery. The battery won't move an 18 wheeler. <laughs> There's only two fuels that'll move it. It's diesel or natural gas. Yeah. And if you accept that, as and I completely agree with what Joe said, that we're going to be using fossil fuels for a long time to come, then the next question is where can we best produce fossil fuels? Right. Where, I mean, I, I would put North America up against any other 
that country in the world, or countries in the world, region in the world, in terms of getting the balance right. Yeah. And let's recognize we're in a, an international economy, and it is yeah. darn competitive. So let's take advantage of our blessings right now and create jobs and personal income growth and the whole bit. Let, let's talk about alternatives for a few minutes. Um, it's pretty remarkable that the revolution that's happened over the past few years has been in fossil fuels. And given all the money that's been spent on alternatives, wind, solar, etc., why hasn't there been more progress when it comes to the, is it the intermittent issue? Where are we making progress? Whoever wants to weigh in there, why have we had a, revo a comparable revolution in alternatives? You mean like renewables? Renewables, why, are we, why can't we depend on wind and solar at this point, so given the, the technology that's been invested in? So we're the fifth largest solar company in the United States. Uh, and I want to, you know, we haven't disagreed with anything up here. If I had to pick one thing that I could disagree with, but I bet you guys would agree at the end of the day, is tax policy. Uh, by e EIA's own data, renewables get 100 times the tax preference items on a per unit of energy than does oil, natural gas, or coal, and 35 times nuclear. I think that's wrong. The reason we've had this huge kind of advent of renewables is because half of the economics of investing in renewables are tied up in tax benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, three things I want you to consider. I'm a big fan of renewables. We've done a whole lot at Southern Company. I think their exciting costs are coming down. They do have their place. They will not displace the old workhorses of oil, coal, and natural gas. Here's the deal. Number one, where the intermittency issues are, the wind, you know, wind resources are, uh, solar resources are, when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, you have intermittency, and so what do you do? You have a backup fuel, what's that gonna be? It's gonna be natural gas. Where the great resources are, solar and wind, generally speaking, there are no people. <laughs> Therefore, you gotta move the resource in the form of transmission lines. Not particularly green, not particularly the best electric reliability design for the United States. And then tax policy. I think we need to get a saner tax policy. In other words, help less, uh, shift less money towards uh, renewables from the, the tax. What I would argue and what I have argued a lot in the past is we need comprehensive tax reform. Uh, you know, whether it's Bacchus and Camp or whether it's the idea of, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, idea of completely redoing everything, take them away and then add back what you need to. But, but it, it, and I take, I take advantage of the tax benefits, please. I'm an <laughs> investor in this stuff. I think it's bad policy. Yeah. But I think you'd agree, and it's certainly the true in Canada, and I think it's true in the United States, that the newfound abundance of natural gas is creating a dynamic around where it's changed the value proposition for renewables, right? Um, oh, sure. Renewables look a whole lot different in a world of $4 gas or $3 gas than they do in a world of $12 gas. Yeah. So I, I think the tension yeah. between those who have a very strong perspective on the role of renewables and those who have a perspective on the role of fossil fuels, I think that dialogue is going to get more contentious rather than less by virtue of the fact that the market dynamic has changed, notwithstanding your comment about we need all of them. Drop the word contentious. My view is you need the portfolio. Nuclear, coal, natural gas, renewables, energy efficiency, we need them all. Let's put them all on an equal footing from a tax policy standpoint and then let the best resource win. So I, I completely agree with what you said, but, we, but that is not the dialogue we're involved in. I get it. And it all of us would agree with what you said. <laughs> the, what I you you, the cheapest energy in the world is the United States. We're 10% cheaper on oil. Uh, we're 75% cheaper on natural gas and we're <coughs> half the price of gasoline around the world. I got a call from, this is one that my colleague here is going to fall out of her chair when she hears her <laughs> call me, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren and I both are from Hughes County, Oklahoma. Huh. She's from Wetumpka and I'm from Holdenville. Holdenville's much larger than Wetumpka. And <laughs> Everyone knows Urban. that, come on. It's 4,000 and Wetumpka's 2,000. But anyway, <laughs> Elizabeth and I are friends and she called me and she started off, she said, Boone, she said, uh, the oil industry gets too many subsidies. And I said, okay, tell me what they are. Well, $4 billion in subsidy. I said, okay, tell me what the $4 billion in subsidy is. Well, she wasn't prepared to give me details. Yeah. It was, I said, no, what you heard was another liberal is on TV and they're saying 
the oil industry gets $4 billion in subsidies. Nobody ever explains what the $4 billion. Do you know what they are? Mm -hmm. Depletion allowance, go ahead. They're what? Depletion allowance, but go ahead. Depletion, is that what they're talking about? No, I'm, I thought you were asking me. I was. I was <laughs> asking you to tell me what those $4 billion dollars because I know the whole four billion but part of it is the depletion allowance that the oil and gas industry gets but their manufacturers just like everybody exactly else right. they yeah. get yeah that's right I mean get we, everything else. the oil industry gets is the same the same as the same as manufacturing does and everything and it's it's interesting because but somebody's gotten up said four billion dollars over and over again so now four billion dollars is just accepted it's a subsidy what the hell is it nobody can tell you but it's uh it's interesting that uh uh, you know, all of this, where the the uh, the oil industry is getting ready to come up, but there's going to be more taxes. Is what you're headed for? But can I say something Please. positive? Nice. Here, okay. <laughs> um, you know, this natural gas revolution, and it is. It's a revolution. It is a game changer. Interestingly enough, is 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 both is a is a centrist place for both sides to come together, yeah. because. It is itself pushing out, now the coal people don't like to hear this, but natural gas by the market is pushing out coal. Natural of gas- Of the United States, we're shipping In the United abroad. States, we're shipping abroad, but pushing out in the United States, so our policy, you know, our production is getting a little cleaner. Um, it's also though, you can't have too much natural gas, like Tom said, 40 years from now, we want to be able to have a mix, a competitive mixture of fuels, both for electricity and for transportation. So why not grab this opportunity? It's, you know, natural gas is a fossil fuel, but it's 50% cleaner than oil. It's substantially cleaner than coal. Continue to invest in clean technologies for coal so that when we export, we can also export our great technologies to keep coal as clean as it can be on the planet. We shouldn't give that up. But it's kind of a win-win, this nat natural gas, if we just move with the way the market is naturally moving, better tax policy, and an all of above strategy. The, the companies, the utility companies, are moving cleaner, greener, and more efficient. The American public would be, I think, surprised and proud of what some of our utilities have done over well, the last 10 years. I mean, just years. to mention that, since 2005, 26% reduction in carbon. Yeah. Uh, since 1990, 85 to 86% reduction in NOx and SOx, with a 40% increase in production. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there's Elizabeth, one, one. Elizabeth Warren, if you don't know, is is senator from Massachusetts, and so. And an author. So I, I, I thought everybody knew her. She was on television this morning, got a good piece on there. A very good leader. Okay, so Greg, just one, let me add one, one more thing on the renewables. I think, uh, so uh, with regards to biofuels, so alternatives to, uh, to uh, gasoline and, or diesel, we've looked at, you know, Chevron, we've looked at about 100 different feedstocks that we could use as an alternative, to, and then 50 different pathways that we could, uh, to generate biofuels. And you know, the conclusion you come to is <laughs> hydrocarbon is just about impossible to, to replace. The energy density that you have there um, is very, very difficult. So the break-even price of biofuels without subsidies or mandates is at least 50 to $100 a barrel higher than we are experiencing today. So it's very difficult for us to envisage a significant unsubsidized or unmandated penetration of biofuels. So, so why do we talk about a bridge? There's no bridge if, if we were all very skeptical about a future dependent on renewables. That's where we need energy innovation. We need to continue to work on getting the price of a photovoltaic panel down. We need to continue to work on the revolutionary technologies that you guys have developed in order to get gas out of the ground. We need to continue to work on, as we are, ways to capture carbon. We run the nation's Carbon Capture Research Center in Alabama. Figure ways to make coal a better alternative. The United States is a Saudi Arabia coal. We have 26% of the world's reserves right here. Why shouldn't we try and develop that resource as well? The objective function has four legs, in my opinion. Clean, safe, reliable, affordable. That's what we need. That's why you need a portfolio. Put a fifth leg on there. Domestic. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for that, sure. The fact is, it is domestic. It is, sure it is. Well, and, and think about the opportunity for innovation and the application of technology in the oil and gas industry, making dramatic improvements in environmental performance. 
And you look at oil sands, for example, the biggest uh, in situ or drillable oil sands recovery, the G most of the GHGs arise from the fact you've got to burn steam, or you've got to create steam, burn natural gas, to heat up the reservoirs to mobilize oil so you can produce it. A lot of companies are looking at uh, non-aqueous methods of recovering oil sands crude. You know, significant reductions in the amount of steam that would be used. Therefore, significant reductions in the amount of GHGs that would be emitted. So I think there's huge opportunity. I made the point earlier that uh, we're in the early stages, not the late stages of a lot of these technologies. There's huge opportunity, I think, to improve environmental Bruno and cost well. performance. Well, and you want to aim that's part ahead. Of the, and that's part of the bridge. Yeah. Yep. And you want to aim ahead on environmental issues. I know everybody gets fixated on carbon and air issues, but I swear to you, water is the environmental yeah. issue of the future. Huh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there, let's talk about that for a second. Is there an argument that we, as, an America, as Americans, subsidize energy companies to the extent that there's access to water at such cheap prices? We also subsidize golf courses, too, I guess. No, uh, I don't think so. Um, gee whiz, when you think about um, the electricity industry, anyway, there's two types of ways we use water. One's through and, 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 and is, is one of the major ones. The other one is evaporation. Through evaporation, something like 98% of the water that we use gets returned in a safe and clean manner. So in my view, I think what we've got to do is continue to work on technologies where we minimize even that use of water. Southern Company is the only one in our industry doing research and development on minimizing water use for power production. I know it's a big issue on fracking. We just got to continue to innovate. That's part of our mission in life. Can I ask a question to the uh corporations, do we incentivize you all to make these innovative changes? Does the tax code incentivize you, or is it neutral on that, and how do we account for it? So we want to encourage companies, I think, with the tax code, if we wanted to do something, to continue to have you take the risk or invest in, you know, in trying. Like right. you said, you tried 50 different yeah, right. ways. You know, we should share some of that, I think, I would think, the country would support us sharing that kind of effort with you so it's not a complete loss on your books and then when you find the thing that works maybe we could all get paid back yeah yeah but i mean do we do any we do that in research sure. and technology we could do right? more there's there's in the tax code there's the research credits okay right. so keep that the other one i would argue and I, listen i'm going to brag on government now i think um, um the doe does a yep. very good job in our industry uh Ernie Moniz, now the current energy secretary, is a terrific guy. Dan Poneman with him and the, the whole crew there are very focused on delivering um, solutions. And when you think about the research curve, it's that S curve. Get the government involved in the early stage right. and then let business commercialize it and take it to scale. Yeah, I'd, and I would just I'd echo that. I think a lot of companies, I'll just take Chevron as for example, we've, a lot of our technology, we're not looking at the basic R&D, right? I think we're relying upon universities and national labs to do some of the right. basic R&D. Because a lot of, we had done that probably several decades ago, but no, no more. So uh, I'll just echo Tom's point. That really is where we're looking for the basics. Then we're taking it in-house and trying to de develop applications and, and furthering the technology. And I think that the, uh, the fiscal policy, the tax policy, certainly are helpful, they're not hurtful in that case. Always more to be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Thought we'd talk about geopolitics for just a few minutes. There's been a lot of buzz about the role that natural gas, U.S. natural gas can play in terms of um, impacting uh, Putin and, and Russia. Your own constituent, uh, Shinir Energy, is a big uh, player there in terms of exporting natural gas starting, I think, next year. Um, how much can the U.S. energy industry play a role in geopolitics and a, and a helpful role in terms of geopolitics today? I think it's tremendous. I mean, I, I've been sanctioned by Putin. I'm proud of it. I wear it as a badge of, of honor. You know, I have been sanctioned um, but of the eight of us that were. But um, I think it has tremendous implications, but it's not going to be next year or the next year, but just because it's not going to happen next year doesn't mean it's not important to work on. I mean, think about the power of North America with America, Canada, and Mexico, not only producing all the energy that we need in a clean, affordable manner to strengthen the middle class south of our border, continue the great relationships with Canada and the U.S., and be able to export to our friends at prices that make money for us 
and are helpful to them to grow their middle class? How many less wars would we have to fight? I'd much rather sell them our products than have to go put our Navy out defending you know, supplies that we have very little control over sometimes. I think it is huge. I think it, it, it puts you know, Russia back uh, to say you can't hold Europe, you can't hold other parts of the country um, hostage over high prices. And like Boone Pickin said, we have great supply here. And if we continue to work on it, now do we have enough supply for the whole world forever? No. But could we play a bigger role right now, the next 10 or 20 or 30 years as countries are really struggling, like Poland right now, to be strong? and independent, you know, this hasn't been that long ago since the World War II ended. Poland is still a nervous country about what happened to it. We hope it never happens again. There are other countries around the world just like it. So when they see America using our resources, they stand up and say, hallelujah for America to be strong across the board. We need to be building more nuclear power plants, more base fuel. I'm going to do as everything I can as chair of the Energy Committee to help you know, put forward many of the ideas that we've heard here today. Well, Greg, can I? Well, well Senator, the, you know, when you look at the Ukraine, I was, I was in Washington two weeks ago, and the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Pritzker, she said, Boone said, what are you all, your industry, going to do about the Ukraine, about Europe being cut off from uh, Russian natural gas? My industry, <laughs> Russian natural gas, uh, hell, they've got shale there. Mm -hmm. they, they can develop their shale. They don't do it. They've got moratorium in Poland, Germany, France, not going to drill that because they don't want to frack the wells. Well, hey, take care of yourself. I mean, let, let, can I build on that? Because I, I think sure, that please, we can export at least two things. We can export LNG and we can export know-how. LNG will take at least two years before the first significant amount of LNG will be going outside the United States. Obviously out of Alaska we have LNG, but out of the Gulf Coast, It'll be a couple years before, before Chenier's facility is up and running, and it'll be several years before any subsequent uh, liquefaction facilities are up. So that's really a long-term solution. Mm. I think the other aspect is really around know-how. Yes, there are moratoria, but on the other hand, there are a number of areas within uh, Eastern Europe uh, that have encouraged Western companies to come in, bring that knowledge that we've developed in the United States, and apply that and see if we can't find and develop resources, sure. some of the type, type formations. Even, well, you're even, in agreement with me. We are, yeah. yeah. Even well, yeah the, but, hey, and, and Chevron's been, uh, they, you tried a couple of wells in Poland. We have indeed, yeah. Yeah, and, but, the, you know, the, why, though, are we going to uh, run to help them when they have resources they could develop, just like we developed our own resources? Because we can make money. <laughs> okay. Well, so right. the, well, that's the, a good, good answer. <laughs> yeah. The coal technology we developed has a great market in Poland. Yeah. Well, the, the gas is going to be expensive to get there from here. You're going to uh, liquefy it, and then you're going to cool it, and then you're going to transport it. When you get there, you're going to have $12 natural gas. But or Poland something. would rather get 12 from us than 12 from Russia, because yes, that's just yeah. Poland's, you know, that's just Poland's, and well, I don't blame Poland. I mean, so you, I'm just saying, this is not a charity. I mean, I'm for <laughs> our, you know, we're not a charity. Um, this is giving a resource that the rest of the world needs. They'd rather buy it from us, work with us, be partners with the U.S. than some of the other countries that they have to deal with. But did you see what Russia did last week, two weeks ago? They increased the price of gas to the Ukraine from $7 to 14 mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty good increase this, for uh, one day. And, you know. <laughs> They're making money. Um, should we take a question or two from the audience? I'm sure there are uh, yes. interested questions. We've only got about five minutes left. Uh, should we, anyone want to stand up and uh, ask a question? Let's see here, I can't really see well. There's a mic there. Uh, good, mor good morning. I'm uh, Terry Outler, the president of uh, Inuit Tapri Canada, the representative of all the Inuit in Canada. And uh, this is, I guess, a specific question to uh, Mr. Naylor and maybe Collier. Um, we're considered the largest private landholders in the world. Um, been very successful in negotiating, negotiating our land claims, and we're looking to develop the area. So 
consider us uh, a friendly and at the same time I'm open to suggestions and to see what we can do and to the senator a message uh, repeal the seal ban. There's not much economic opportunity for our people in the north and uh, this is one thing that we need to look at as one of the largest private landholders so any um, talks on the Arctic and any thoughts? John, you want me to take a, a first crack at that? I, the first comment I would make is that uh, you know there's there's many many examples of great business relationships between the private sector, the oil and gas industry, and First Nations. Uh, they often get overlooked, but I think there's a tremendous track record of, of mutually beneficial business relationships, and our industry is open to that. I think the challenge in the Arctic, frankly, at the moment, is two things, uh, and I have the uh, 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 had the opportunity, if you will, to work on the McKinsey gas pipeline for a long time, and uh, it had its its potential moment in the sun, but it doesn't look so great anymore. I think the challenge uh, on the natural gas side, if you look at the Arctic or look at the North, is simply the abundance of natural gas supply we have in Canada in the lower 48. It's going to make the economics, I think, of natural gas development in the North tougher. It doesn't make it impossible, but it's going to make it tougher. And the oil opportunity, I think, is a different, a different opportunity in terms of economics, some environmental and social challenges that we've got to uh, sort our of way through. But I would, when I look at the north, I think the oil opportunity is probably greater than the gas opportunity in the near term. And uh, industry needs to work with um, First Nations and others to uh, try and make that happen. Yeah. I'll just, I'll, building on that, I think that uh, Chevron's recent experience with the First Nations uh, is really centered around two of the fields uh, that we have up in northern BC. Liard and Horn River, and then uh, working to transport that to the coast to a liquefaction facility. Uh, we've had fantastic uh, discussions and resolution with uh, most of the First Nations uh, groups there. So I think it's been a very positive relationship. And uh, we see, you know, for LNG facilities uh, in general, you know, those are things that are going to be around for decades to come. So having a strong relationship with, uh, with First Nations we see is absolutely imperative. Why don't we take one last question? I think we have time. Thank you. To... Sharon Smolian from Environline. This is for Mr. Collier, please. Um, there's a comment on David Sawyer from the International Institute of Sustainability sort of identifying Canada as the North Korea, uh, sorry, the North Korea of the climate world. So with that being said, recognizing... Ouch. Yeah, yeah. North He's Canadian. <laughs> Recognizing the significance of this sector to its economy, Alberta is proposing a 44-40 uh, approach, a requirement to reduce emissions intensity by 40% with a penalty for exceeding this limit at $40 per tonne. So when you include the offsets and tax-free contributions to a technology fund, the cost to meet these emissions targets drops to about $16 per tonne or 10 to 20 cents per barrel. Referencing a comment Rick George made as well as the CEO of Shell with respect to There's the fact question. that that might wreck their industry, could you please tell me how anyone in the oil, oil sands industry can say that 10 to 20 cents per barrel will wreck its industry and then expect anyone to make an investment in it? Yeah, a couple of comments I'd make. One is that we, as you know, I think have a carbon policy in Alberta today, which is one of the, one of the few jurisdictions that actually has that. Uh, our industry has been fairly open about uh, a willingness to support carbon policy more broadly in Canada. Uh, we have two provisos. One is that you've got to think about competitiveness because this is a, a global business, not a local business. And second, that uh, reinvestment in technology is, is absolutely a key factor in all of this. Our view is that if we're going to reduce emissions on the ground, that's going to come through technology. And the technology fund dimension of the Alberta policy, which we've supported federally, uh, we think is an absolutely uh, important element of a policy to be brought forward. Ultimately, it's up to governments to decide you know, how they want to approach policy. Um, as I say, we've been, as an industry, broadly supportive with those couple of provisos. In Thank Alberta you. and BC, which are the two jurisdictions in which most of production comes from in Canada, both have carbon policies in place. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming, everybody's attention. I want to thank the panelists for participating. <laughs>